A ton of horror movies were made in the 1980s. Lots of teens and people in their early 20s getting in trouble and getting killed. And most of them at the hands of a slasher or some alien invasion. Road movies had some traction, but they were not exactly in the main subgenre in horror. In 1986, writer Eric Redd and director Robert Harmon changed this by bringing The Hitcher to screens everywhere. Why are you doing this to me? You're a smart kid. Figure it out. Nice hearing from you, Carlos. The film may not have seemed like an obvious choice, but it soon became influential, and a slew of copycats appeared through the decades since. Roger Ebert did not love this film. In fact, he gave it a zero in his review and said that no one should go see it. We gave two thumbs down to the hitcher, the disgusting exploitation of perverted violence. We hated it. Those are some fighting words from one of the most revered critics of his time. Ebert was quite strong in his assessment. Of course, the film is not for everyone. However, for those who love it, it's a great film. In fact, it gets a solid 9 out of 10 from yours truly these days. It may not have been the same upon first viewing, but a rewatch as an adult brings a change of heart. Quick recap of the story here. The Hitcher is about a young man who is driving a car from Chicago to San Diego as a sort of delivery, fun, road trip hybrid. On the way, he picks up a Hitcher who turns out to be pure evil. As things progress, it's clear the Hitcher is a killer, and it seems that the young traveler will have to take matters into his own hands to stop him from killing more innocent victims. As an 80s baby, I didn't see this one until the 90s, when I was going through every last horror film available at the many video stores in my area. Being a Montreal kid meant there was a video store every few blocks around where I lived and where my father lived. It meant a seemingly endless supply of movies as each store seemed to have a different selection. These days, I watch movies like it's my job because it is my job. While going through every single horror, sci-fi, and action film, I rented The Hitcher. However, here's The Hitch and The Stitch here. I don't remember watching it. Surprise, motherfucker! I know I've seen it as a teen, I know I had decided not to pick it up on VHS from a collection, and I know I had some memories of it, but generally speaking, outside of finding C. Thomas Howell's super cute as well as Nash's tortured scene, not so cute, there were no memories of this film left in my ADHD movie-filled trivia library of a brain. I just remember that I really liked it back in the day. So I fixed this as an adult and rewatched the film. A recent rewatch is what brought the 9 out of 10 rating here. The film now, through adult eyes, is of course different, but more of a given following rewatches of other movies I saw back in the day and how they affected me. The young protagonist, Jim Halsey, was about 20 years old. This made him a cute guy to me at 18, but now, at my age, he could easily be my son. But still, it's easy to connect with him as a lonely road traveler who has been in a car for miles and miles without anything of interest to do or anyone to speak to. The Hitcher, John Ryder, is still scary. But with the added experience of having crossed the country by car three times, each trip involving San Diego. These roads are familiar, and so is their loneliness, their emptiness at times. Of course, these days, no one wants to pick up a hitchhiker, so the film is a bit less plausible. You gonna tell me where you're going? However, a younger driver may feel immortal, like nothing bad can happen to them, so picking up a hitcher could happen. Maybe. What I'm trying to say here is that the connection to Jim has evolved over time and that the fear of the hitcher is something very real, no matter how the viewer connects with the lead. What works the best here is the story and how it's brought to the screen. The fear is a massive part of the film and it's brought on slowly by bringing in familiar things like an empty road, a hitcher who may have seemed friendly at first and then becomes dangerous. The film is not all action all the time, it gives the fear time to simmer, time to develop. It's a slow burn at the same time as it is brutal. Watching along as Jim tries to get rid of him, then tries to survive, then tries to really get rid of him more permanently, it all comes together to build this intense atmosphere of dread, a feeling that is best absorbed by watching alone in the dark with no distraction. This is a film that works in the way it brings the story to the screen. There's something to be said for leaving some stuff to the imagination, which this film does while also showing the viewer how truly horrific the killer can be. This is one of those films with a careful balance between the seen and the unseen. Another very strong aspect of The Hitcher is the acting. C. Thomas Howell in The Part of Jim is excellent, showing boredom, fear, determination, and a full range of emotions. He makes Jim much more than just a random victim for a maniac. He makes Jim fully fleshed and gives him character and strength. Of course, the appreciation for his work here evolved over the years, but only to see it as a stronger performance than what was noticed at first. Howell himself has said this is one of his favorite movies, and it's a definite good choice on his part. In the role of John Ryder, the rider hitchhiking by the side of the road, Rucker Hauer is fantastic. He's creepy, he's scary, and he feels dangerous. Considering that Hauer was not the first choice, he was the best choice. 
Initially, Sam Elliott was selected for the part, and from what can be found online, he was considered to be quite scary. Had he not had a conflict in scheduling, this could have been a completely different film. Maybe not for the best. Another critical part of the cast here's Jennifer Jason Lee is Nash. Her work is solid, and she really sells Nash's death scene, the torture before it, and how Nash goes through it for that sequence. Her presence adds more than just fodder for the killer. She's an anchor for Hal's gym and balances out the story with a different character and viewpoint. The cinematography by director of photography John Seale takes advantage of the remote locations and the desolation of the road. The film's main road is Route 66, or Interstate 40 these days. It's a road many have taken, yet it often feels like it's completely empty, something the film depicts so well. It adds to the atmosphere and to the sense of dread. The film gains a lot from the images it shows and how they are shown, and the work by Seal is on point in terms of showing exactly what the film needs. The look is a deserted road, a desolate location. It's damn near perfect. The film is low on gore by today's standards, but some folks were shocked by it back in the day, along with its violence. Ebert, who was mentioned earlier along with Siskel, denounced the film's violence as something to be avoided. These days, the film comes off as almost tame in terms of violence. What is more important is the psychological aspect of things. Because you can sure as shit bet I'm gonna squeeze my... It's not how much blood we see in the death of Nash, but the mental image, the emotional impact, and how it comes off without showing absolutely every detail of the situation. This scene, by the way, has been said to have come from Rutger Hauer, who thought it would be more effective than crushing her between a wall and the truck. As it stands, this scene is one of the most powerful of the film, both for what it contains and what it does not. This scene is also powerful because of everything that comes before it, because of the buildup of dread and fear, and because of how the film developed before getting it. It's a great example of how this film builds itself through the characters and the locations, through the cat and mouse game played on the road, and through every little detail that leads to the climax, which is after this scene and beautifully handled. This film has lasted as long as it did as a cult favorite, and as a highly satisfying horror film for those who love an intense ride with a great attention to detail. The cult status here is in part due to the film's quality, and to its stars, as Rutger Hauer is beloved in the genre and both C. Thomas Howell and Jennifer Jason Leigh are so good here. They give performances to remember. This film shows how a road movie can also be a scare film, and it has inspired many other films since, including some that were more or less connected, such as the spinoff from Mexico Deadly Road from 1993. In 2003, a sequel was released starring C. Thomas Howell called The Hitcher 2, I've Been Waiting, which could have been better. You had one job. Of course, the film got a gritty modern update in the form of a remake in 2007. As for the remake, well, yeah, that happened, but it didn't feel like a film that was needed or wanted by fans, and something felt off about it. The Hitcher is a film that gains from being rewatched, especially as one ages, to see how it affects the viewer and how the story comes off differently depending on the age and life experiences of the viewer. Of course, the horror is effective no matter the age, but there is something different about it once one is well-traveled by way of roads and highways. The film captures the desolation and loneliness of the road, which mixes with the freedom and hope being on the road can bring in a way that only this movie seems to have captured. This is a film that is well-written, well-directed, well-shot, well-acted, and more. The film has many aspects that mostly go unnoticed, so they blend in perfectly to bring the film to life. The costumes, decor, vehicle selections, and a bunch more are so well made they just are part of the world on the screen. All of this comes together to make a film that stands the test of time and is a great watch to this day. As I said, this baby deserves all the love and more. I'm giving it a 9 out of 10. Hi everybody, how are you? Lance and I just rewatched The Hitcher, and I gotta say uh, it definitely holds up like a champ, still to this day. So uh, we figured we'd annoy you and uh, grill you a little bit about the movie, if you don't mind. Yeah, you bet. Whatever you, whatever you guys would like to hear about it. <laughs> oh God. Okay, you open you open up the floodgates then. Absolutely. Uh, I, I want to give just a bit of background. How old were you when you when you sold the script? You were in your twenties or something, right? Yeah, I, I was about 25, 24 or twenty five when I uh, when I sold the screenplay. I was I wrote it when I was twenty three. Uh, and I'd, I'd moved from New York to Texas I'd, uh, and I moved to Austin. I'd, I'd grown up in Manhattan and I, I kind of wanted the change of scene. And uh, when I got on the road, I drove. I did an auto drive away just like the character Jim Halsey does. That's how I got the idea for that. Uh, and back in the day, I, I don't know whether they still have this. You know, you could there were services that you could um, deliver a car from point A to point B, anywhere around the country. Like if you needed to go to Texas, as I did, they would have a car that would need to go to Texas. And so you didn't pay for the rental. 
You just paid for the gas and you delivered it. So I did that. But, um, you know, growing up in the East Coast, uh, I'd never seen the wide open spaces really before. Uh, and Texas, Oklahoma, you know, places I drove through when I was going. And it made a it made an indelible impression, uh, just the sheer weight of the sky and the landscape. And it was it was un, it was unnerving, actually, for, a, you know, for an East Coast kid like me, a city kid. Um, so that definitely, plus having a lot of time on my hands while I was doing the drive, kind of informed the, the story. And I'd been I'd been thinking for a while about. I've, I'd always thought that the Doors song Riders in the Storm would make a great movie. I knew it would at least make a great opening for a movie. You know, I mean, you could literally begin with somebody driving and a hitchhiker in the road and the rain and the lightning and picking them up and their uh, killer on the road. Uh, so I, I started with that. And uh, the story just kind of fell into place during that long drive. And a lot of it had to do was I, I sort of said, like, with each progressive scene, what wouldn't I expect? What's the last thing I would expect to happen next? Mm-hmm. That would, that was kind of the creative engine, if you would, if you will, of, of the script. So by the time I got to Texas, I actually rented an apartment, sat down and like banged it out, banged it out in like a month. And okay. um, from then, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was living in Texas uh, at the time, and I'd, I'd really never spent any significant time in Los Angeles. I didn't have an agent. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know any companies there. So, you know, I was sort of faced with the problem, you know, okay, I've written this script. Now, how the hell do I sell it? And I, I what I did know was that the uh, that there was a general rule in Hollywood. Remember, this is back in the 80s. It's a different landscape now. But, you know, you had all these different companies with all these different development executives, Um and uh, I knew that they generally didn't accept scripts that were not submitted by an agent. And, you know, I didn't didn't have one of those. So I uh, I I wrote a teaser letter uh, that basically dared people to read the script. I think I said some bullshit like, you know, when you you read the script, you won't sleep for a week. When the movie gets made, the country won't sleep for a month. You know, <laughs> I, I, I nice. did a and I gave the, I did what I guess we would call a log line now. You know, I gave him about a paragraph, a short paragraph description and the characters and uh, had stationery printed up and was very formal about it. And I got a copy of the California production manual in Texas and that listed all the film production companies. Um, and so I sent out the letter. I sent about maybe 400 letters and I got about a 40% response, I think, that actually asked to see the script. But the story of how it actually got to Ed Feldman is very Hollywood. Uh, th- this happens a lot, as anybody who's in the business knows. You know, um, it's a very convoluted industry, and the path from, you know, script to film is often very circuitous. But um, one of the producers I'd sent it to was uh, a guy named Phil Feldman, um, and I knew him. You know, I knew movies. I knew he produced The Wild Bunch, and you know, I said to myself, 23, 24 year old kid, ah. Guy that produced the Wild Bunch, he's gonna love, he's gonna love that year. So I sent it to Feldman, and there was another Feldman at Fox named Ed Feldman, who was another producer over there, who, um, who had a company. And Fox mailroom delivered it to the wrong Feldman, delivered yeah. delivered it to Ed Feldman. And his development guy was a, a fellow named David Bombeck, who's a super smart uh, development executive with great taste. And he, um, he actually emailed me back. Uh, he sent me a letter back. We didn't have email in those days. You know, I got a letter one day and he said, you know, normally we don't accept unsolicited material, but you piqued my interest in the script. And I did. And, uh, he immediately liked it. And, and we started having story conversations and I was, uh, in Texas and broke at the time I was driving a taxi. Uh, so I didn't have a phone. So like his running joke was, <laughs> The, the first story conversations, story discussions we had in the movie was punctuated by the sound of a quarters being put into a payphone, you know, <laughs> a Texaco bus stop, a Texaco gas station. So that was sort of how it began. I moved to L.A. a couple months later, went to the American Film Institute and sold the script when I was there. Uh, John told me a story uh, earlier about how he has a version of the script. So. Uh, how many versions or how many drafts did you go through before they picked it up? Was that. Like, did you have a, a bunch of material that you kind of like polished or did you get the one script to them and then you polished it with them before it came to screen? 
I worked with um, David and, and the other producer, um, um, Kip Oman, at the time. I mean, the biggest change, the, the the whole beginning, the whole first act of the script is pretty much, as I remember, very, very close to what was in the original script. Um, <clears throat> the middle was a little longer, and I tightened up some of that. Um, the biggest change was the third act, which um, I redid. And I redid it. I, I came up with a new, an alternate third act that involved the prison bus and, um, you know, the kids stealing the gun from the, the Texas Ranger commander and going and uh, the final showdown. So that was something that was done after the script was sold. Well, now I'm curious, what was the original last act? Um, it The same chain of events happened in mm -hmm. that the, the kid arranged, you know, uh, the kid went after uh, John Ryder after uh, Nash gets killed, but it was in an urban setting. Okay. This is part of the problem because, you know, this was the action proper. This movie was, you know, a road movie, uh, you know, set in the deserts. And um, I definitely used, and what's certainly still in the film right now, um, this idea of the claustrophobia of the wide open spaces. Cause I remember when I first encountered them driving through, it was, was very oppressive and uh, continued with that theme and through near dark, you know, the, the yeah. idea that the mornings dusts are very, very uh, spectacular. Um, but I love the idea that you can see forever and there's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. I mean, the, the juxtaposition of that okay. was great. And, you know, I think that's sort of intrinsic anyway to most road movies. Actually, I just, I just have to add that because I felt that feeling once in my life to my memory and is when when I drove to your wedding. Oh yeah, you you covered. Uh, yeah. uh, John was my the best man at my wedding for oh, yeah, yeah. awesome. Out there. Mm -hmm. um, and John drove from Canada to Wyoming, so yeah, you went through some of those uh, some very oh, yeah. uh, wide open country and and parts of Wyoming uh, like uh, eastern Wyoming are are very much like that. Yeah, no, it was very scary. I was like, you know, if my car breaks down, I'm fucked. Like there's yeah. nothing out there, nothing there, nothing there. It's just big, wide open spaces, but nothing. And yeah, no, it was a bit unnerving. I remember that. Um, I and mean, I think that's essential to a good road thriller. You know, the idea that there's this real economy of elements. You know, there's the random gas station and diner and you alone in a car and maybe another car after you or somebody after you. Um, it, it's a marvelously spare format. And I think it's been done. Uh, done very well uh, many times and the hitch was one of those then i i do have to ask because you know before lance and i have been having a discussion about john Ryder, who is john Ryder? what is john Ryder? is he supernatural is he not is he symbolism uh, i compared him to life john Ryder is life beats the <laughs> shit out of you keeps coming <laughs> But then you man up, and at the end of the movie, after you blow life away, you're 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 a man, yeah. So for you as the writer, so basically John Ryder's daddy, mm -hmm. who, who is he to you? Did, did you have a an, a clear idea of a backstory? Is he supernatural? Is he grounded? Is he a metaphor? Who was he to you? Um Yes, I most certainly had a backstory and a psychological backstory. No, to me, he is not supernatural. Okay. Uh, he's a real guy and everything he does in the movie, um, for instance, um, being able to appear and find the kid, you know, and 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 appear in a way that seems like uh, he's a specter or a spirit. Yeah. You know, he's stolen a, a cop police radio he's following the radio calls he knows how to get there i mean there's a procedural reality if in the story if you if you look into it but you know it's a funny thing i used to tell people um and i most certainly did and we all did you know had a had a psycho had a, the a very very clear psychology for why the hitchers uh, john Ryder's doing this to jim halsey mm. um but you know i used to tell people what it was but in recent years I've, I've been struck by the fact that everybody has their own perception of it. They come to the movie and they have, because we don't explain it. Not, not, not really. No. Um, the, uh, we hint at it, but we, we don't really explain it. I've come to love the fact that everybody has different perceptions of what their relationship is. And I mean, it runs the gamut from supernatural to every form of psychology you can imagine. And I've actually thought that's part of the real strength of the movie. So I don't tell people what I was thinking. 
anymore. I let you you let it's like a it's like a Rorschach blot or you know a painting. You know, people bring their own personal um you know, based on their background, based on their psychology, they bring their own uh, take on what's going on between these characters. So, yeah, I, 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 I sort of keep it to myself these days. I like, I like that people have their own, uh, their own ideas. More power to them. I actually think this anecdote is pertinent to this conversation and to John and Mai's relationship. About maybe I have never seen The Hitcher two. I never will see the Hitcher. <laughs> why, why would you? Why would you? I, I haven't seen either, and I know about it. I'm okay. Oh uh, yeah, that's funny. The war I could, continues. I could care less about the Hitcher too. But yeah. years ago, and we're talking ten, maybe fifteen years now. John brought me a copy of of the Hitcher too, and he has. John is convinced that one day he's going to get me to watch this movie, and I've told him straight out, it's never going to happen. <laughs> you would not believe. The tricks and the schemes, John. So th- this will continue for the next twenty or thirty <laughs> years. I'm sure. So, so you're gonna go to your grave without without watching this movie. Like that's yes, that's dude. your okay, dude. I've I've swapped the DVDs. You know, like I'm at Eric's house. Oh, let's watch <laughs> the Wild Bunch. You know, so yeah, sure. So I put the Hitcher two DVD in it. Just, let's see. You know, he's like, hey, what the hell is this? <laughs> can can we agree that? Because, you know, I know that Sam Elliott was considered to, to play a, a John Ryder at a certain point. He was, Sam was cast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sam was cast and backed out. He delivered a, an utterly terrifying audition, <laughs> and um, which I, I, I was thrilled when he was, ca- he was cast. He's one of my favorite actors, and I thought he would have been brilliantly frightening in the role. I unfortunately never got a chance to see that, uh, see that audition. Um, but, yeah, no, he was cast. He had – he – Basically, I think he got cold feet. I think the character was just too scary. Uh, and, yeah. you know, Rutger, when we cast him, embraced all that. You know, I mean, Rutger has no problems with playing bad guys. And Well, that, that was my question. I don't think the film would be the same or the ambiguity in terms of the John Ryder and um, C. Thomas Howell, uh, Halsey, 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 whatever, uh, would be the same if Sam Elliott would have been cast because... Uh, Rudger Hauer, from my perspective, brings a very what was that fancy word I keep forgetting? Ethereal. Well, ethereal. ethereal. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. He he feels like almost otherworldly. Uh, where Sam Elliott is a very man's man, rough and tumble. You know, I think it would have been more. Actually, he would be great as White Knuckle. <laughs> to, to be honest, but, yeah, which is in a, a book that Eric read, also a screenplay, is trying to get off the ground right now, but. I think Rutger Hauer's casting really elevated uh, that the, the vagueness of the of the character and the, the it just it's just weird. He's just a weird motherfucker, man. <laughs> you know. I, I, th- I think John, you made actually a really really perceptive uh, observation there regarding casting because had we cast Sam, um, the movie would have been more grounded. Sam's yeah. very realistic actor. Uh, it would have been more of a procedural, and it would have worked great. But Rutger has. One of my favorite things out of any of the reviews that came out in, in Newsweek, there there was a reviewer named Jack Kroll who said that Rutger had the depraved glamour of a fallen angel. Yeah. And I, I, I love that because it's true. Rutger brings a it was just what he had viscerally as a star. You know, he had this ephemeral, if you want, but visceral at the same time and obviously very powerful. Uh, but there was there was the there was something almost supernatural about him. You know, and and in in just his performance style, and uh, he could act with looks and glances extensively, which was very important because the Hitcher was a script that had very very tearsed dialogue. It was always going to be done in the you know in, in expressions and glances and and looks and stuff like that. And yeah, no, I think it would have been a very. I, I think that some of the qualities that people like and that you mentioned in the film would not have been present had Rutger not been there. I mean, he made an indelible contribution to the movie. Well, I was going to say the uh, the most humorous part, I think, is directly tied to to Rucker's performance, which is when they get they stop at that little um, it's not a check, but it's like a road work thing. <clears throat> and the guy comes up and he's like, "Where are you from?" He's like Chicago. He's like, "God, my wife's from Rockford." And he's like, you know, he has his the knife by his crotch, and like that that's such a serious scene, but like he has that sort of like playful eyes, and he kind of you know he, he looked kind of joyful. And the guy goes, ah. "What does he say?" He said, I, "I wrote it down." It's like the best part. He goes, uh, yeah, yeah. "Hey, sweethearts." Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and it's like that's that's why Rucker is the best because that scene was terrifying, 
and also, uh, you know, I chuckled. So I think that that's a, a skill of an actor and obviously a writer. Well, Rutger was a, was a very funny man in person. He had a tremendous sense of humor and he liked people who were humorous, you know? So yeah, the humor was a very big part of his whole kind of identity. Um, you know, he did all his own stunts or he did a lot of his own stunts, a lot of the driving stunts, a big, tough guy, but very, very, very funny and, and, and very unique individual. Hang on. How, how did you feel when you read that? Because I, I read it before we recorded the rest of the episode, uh, Ebert's review of the film at the time. I lost any and all respect for uh, Roger Ebert after reading that. He, he took a, a, a real personal shot at me as writing the script. And uh, I was 24 at the time. And, you know, it really hurt my feelings. Yeah, it was. I thought it was a, you know, reviewers can like a film or not like a film. But when reviewers get personal based on nothing, you know, I mean, I've it's uh, I, 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 I since have taken tremendous offense to that when I see it both either to me or to colleagues, you know, say what you want to say about a movie. You can like it. You can hate it. But, you know, don't make, you know, personal comments on the people that make the film who you don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I thought uh, he, he lost all credibility to me as a reviewer after that. Well, you know, at the end of the day, the the, the, the joke, you know, the last word is is yours. And, you know, uh, Mr. Uh, Robert Harmon and, and Rutger Hauer and everybody involved in the picture, because look, we're 2023, dude. About you're it. on the show talking about it it's the movie that lives on and lives on and lance and i were talking about that before it's passed on from generations to generations to generations uh a lot of oscar winning movies for example will are will be forgotten they will yes. not be passed on and passed on and passed on and passed on i saw the hitcher for the first time on beta on fucking beta a lot of people did yeah they're yeah. they're increasingly seeing it back the way we intentionally shot it you know in scope and widescreen and getting an idea of the, the beauty of that look with you know john seal's cinematography and, oh yeah but the whole way i mean the great use of natural light in that movie mm, uh, yes. I mean, it, you know i mean the one thing i'll say uh, maybe to close is you know as everybody knows when they make a movie you're focusing on making the movie you're making you you have no idea you hope that it'll stand the test of time but you don't know you really, you only focus, all you can do is focus on, you know, getting the picture done as well as you can. So um, the Hitcher has stood the test of time and that's really satisfying, but it's not anything that you can really plan. Some movies do, some movies don't. Um, and that one for you know, probably a number of reasons has, which is, uh, which is tremendous. I mean, it's obviously it's, it's makes me feel really good. Well, as you know, and the hitcher is why I started writing. The hitcher is how you and I met and how we became very good friends and in a what 20 year relationship as friends. Longer now, but yeah. Is it longer? Fuck. 2023, buddy. Ah, <laughs> as they say on Bo Quebecois. Fuck, man, I'm getting old. Um, so, you know, so for me, like I said, in you know, early in the show to Lance, it will always have a special place in my heart because it, it, it was just more than a movie. It literally uh, sent my life in directions. And, you know, I wouldn't be friends with you if it wasn't for the Hitcher. And I wouldn't have started uh, writing scripts if it wasn't for the Hitcher. So, arigato. Well, you know, that's one of the nicest parts for me to hear that about making the movie. You know, it's all the other things that, not not necessarily we're part of the movie but yeah that it, it means a great deal to me that it means the film means a lot to you and to, to audiences still no cool. well thank you and until we get you next time for the hitch or two <laughs> <laughs> you keep trying you can, i'll tell you something the day you get me to see the hitch or two you can announce it on the show this will <laughs> never happen ever yeah, but, it, will be, we, it will be in old people's homes i'm still trying <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> all Have right. a great day, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.